So as I begin this morning, let me open with prayer. Loving Father, we ask that you would be with us this morning. We all want to know what the devil has planned to try to trip us up with. So Father, we ask that you would bless in the hearing and each heart here. And also, Father, that you would anoint these lips, for this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Exodus 3, 7 through 9, should be up on the screen. And it says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression to which the Egyptians oppressed them. Now, you may think this is strange, but I'm going to relate the slavery that the Egyptians put on the Israelites to what the devil is trying to do now to us. Okay? Okay? Each one of us have fallen into sin at some time, if not several times a day. And you say, I'm never going to do that again, and you turn right around and do it anyway. And Jesus is the only one that can break sin's power. You know? <clears throat> and sometimes we get upset because of injustices. Not somebody paying you rent but injustices. And we're always going to have them on this earth. And we always have some kind of problem to distract us from reading God's word and drawing close to him. But we need to keep our eyes on Jesus because the devil's always trying to distract. And we need to keep our eye on him because he has many blessings for us when we connect with him. Amen? And when we connect with him, the blessings that he wants to give help us to be in harmony with him. Mark 13, 13 says, and I want you to catch this, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. But we have to endure. Sometimes that's difficult. Okay? Exodus 13, 16, the second part of the verse says, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. God is aware of what's happening in our lives too. They were slaves because Egypt took away their religious liberty. Understand what I'm saying? Okay? They were persecuted for their faith. I want you to think for a moment that they wouldn't allow you to worship indoors a few months ago. Okay? Yet you could go to Walmart. I want you to think about this, okay? And you could shop at other places like Home Depot, but you couldn't come to church, okay? God is calling us out of modern day Egypt or Babylon. And I want you to think about something else. And that's something they still don't want is our children to go to Sabbath school where they learn about God and the God that can help them. Okay? And they were slaves, and I believe many are slaves, not only to that, but also media and food and sex and worldly pleasures. Egypt was saved through seven terrible years of famine by the wisdom of God through Joseph's administration. But this was forgotten by the leaders in Egypt, and they turned their backs on God <clears throat> that had saved them. And so they became, the people of God became enslaved. In the same way, God set up America to be the land of freedom, of speech, 
and religion. A beacon, if you will, for religious freedom, teaching the three angels' messages to all the world. But America has turned its back on God and its laws. How do you say? By enacting laws that go directly against God and his law. His, like homosexual or LGBTQ rights, the Equality Act, which is in the government right now, which will require even church organizations to hire homosexuals, do away with the Bible and many other things. Okay? Hate speech, outlawing the Bible, abortion. And let me remind you that they did abortion back in Egypt with all the baby boys. Okay? And another fact that you might not know, 42.6 million children are aborted every year around the globe. 42.6 million aborted every year. They've closed down churches, especially for our youth, trying to take God out of the Pledge of Allegiance, taking God out of the mainstream business, closing businesses deemed undesirable because of the owner's beliefs, and persecuting those of faith in God, and now freedom of speech by big tech. We are markedly being enslaved. Climate change, LBGQ, and many other things will be used to suppress religious liberty. Satan's hidden purpose is to make us a welfare state so that we'll submit to dictatorship. So how did the Israelites become enslaved? Patriarchs and Prophets 241 says, as time rolled on, the great man whom Egypt owed so much and the generation blessed by his labors passed to the grave. And there rose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. It wasn't that he was ignorant of Joseph's of services to the nation, but he wished to make no recognition of them and so far as possible to bury them in oblivion. Going on, it says, and the Israelites had already become very numerous. They were very fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceedingly mighty. And the land was filled with them under Joseph's fostering care and the favor of the king who, had, who was then ruling. They had spread rapidly over the land. But notice this next sentence. It says, but they had kept themselves a distinct race, having nothing in common with the Egyptians and their customs and, or religion. And their increasing numbers now excited the fears of the king and his people, lest in case of war, they should join themselves to the enemies of Egypt. And we've recently seen this in the military, okay? The devil's game is always to divide and conquer, always. Going on, it says, yet policy forbade their banishment from the country. Many of them were able and understanding workmen, and they added greatly to the wealth of the nation. The king needed such laborers for the erection of his magnificent palaces and temples. Accordingly, he ranked them with the Egyptians who had sold themselves with their possessions to the kingdom and soon taskmakers were set over them and their slavery became complete. I want you to notice here, he made no distinction. And that's how, because the Egyptians had sold themselves for their food. And so now they made no distinction. The Bible doesn't say exactly how they started, but I believe they started to criticize and falsely accuse them in the king's court and without a shred of evidence. He falsely accused them of being disloyal to the kingdom. And at the end of time, God's people will also be accused 
of being disloyal to the country and to God for sure. And God's people will be put in a corner and forced to make a decision to obey the laws of man and the land or to be loyal to God. And they will be punished for treason and thereby thrown in prison or worse or be disloyal to God and lose their eternal home. We all will be tested like never before. Continuing on, it says, and the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and brick and in all manner of service in the field and all the service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Great Controversy 615 says, as the Sabbath has become the special point of controversy throughout Christendom, and religious and secular authorities have combined to enforce the observance of Sunday, the persistent refusal of a small minority to yield to the popular demand will make them objects of universal execration. It will be urged that the few who stand in opposition to an institution of the church and a law of the state ought to be not to be tolerated and that it is better for them to suffer than for the whole nation to be thrown into confusion and lawlessness. Exodus 1, 9 and 10 says, And he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more mighty than we. Come, let's deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And it happened in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us, and so go up out of the land. Here we see the fear tactic used. It's hard to look legitimate to enslave them. When you want to control people, there's always something that causes fear. Governments use this to bring people under submission. Right now, there's a fear of uh, COVID. <clears throat> and so there's a medical tyranny developing globally. Also a fear of communism and socialism which is being forced on the people, even though they don't want it. Along with many who have lost their property and economic advantages, Rome is setting up the image of the beast in America. During the Dark Ages, the Bible was suppressed, and not all the people had, could get their hands on it. Therefore, there was no motivation to do better because the landlord would take what they had or wanted away from those that had it. He wanted and took away all their wealth and possessions, and thus they were enslaved to the church and to the oppressive system. Luther came along, and he brought an emphasis on the Bible, freedom of conscience, emancipation from slavery to Catholicism. And now there was a motivation that they could, that they could be all they could be in Christ. And submission of conscience to God and not the Catholic Church brought freedom and liberty for all. The Dark Ages were called that because they didn't have the Bible and they didn't have religious liberty. Without Luther, America would not have developed the religious liberty that we enjoy today. And his wife, Katie, put the concept of liberty into practice with labor and industry and private property. So now Europe was free to make the intellectual advances in science and other areas and thus the people were lifted out of poverty to a better life because of God's word. So Rome 
has always wanted to keep the people poor and dependent, a socialistic dictatorship. And that's why Rome wants to destroy Protestant and all the nations that are Protestant. Okay? Because it hates the Bible and it hates freedom. Understand, that's not biblical. The Jews in the 17th century in the Protestant countries developed banks, and that helped overtake the backwardness and stagnation of the Catholic countries. The Waldenses and others became itinerant merchants and maintained their own independence spiritually and economically. But there have been no dictators in Protestant countries, and that's not by accident. But in Catholic and Muslim countries, there are dictatorships. Rome is socialistic dictatorship, uh, has tried to force the image of the beast on the U.S. for a long time. Last Day Events, page 134, says the Roman Catholic principles will be taken under care and protection of the state. This national apostasy will speedily be followed by a national ruin. In order for that to happen here, they have to enforce the Sunday law. So look at the economic situation we're in right now. It is also working in its social justice principles to make the image of the beast It's moral say the end justifies the means. And it's economic sanctions, so the rich and the poor will be all on the same level. That social justice or redistribution of wealth. Have you heard that word before? Let's make everybody on the same level. Rome desires to take society back to medieval times. He wants to strip the rich of their wealth, and so society will all be poor. That way they can be controlled. Matthew 26, 1. I want you to notice what the Bible says. It doesn't say everybody will be equal. It always says what? You will always have what? Okay. Rome is promoting a welfare state here and in all Protestant nations. He is using the pandemic to take us back to medieval times and to make it a just society, as they say, making us dependent on the state and their church. That way people can be controlled. Climate change will bring, be bringing on the Sunday law, I believe. The plan is not to use our natural resources like oil and gas and nuclear. And by not using the natural resources, it creates poverty, which is in the interest of the Catholic Church. The pandemic is being used to achieve this socialistic goal. They want to use the crisis to control buying and selling movement and travel and to be, for it to be severely restricted, slowly enslaving the people. And to achieve the socialistic model of Catholicism, they must do away with the Protestant idea of private property. The Pope declared that no one has the right to private property. And the church is trying to take control of industry, commerce, trade, economy, and the people. But history has shown that capitalism and individualism lifts people out of poverty. And in order to create discontent and destabilize the government, they are using racial, gender, immigration, resentments, and discontent. 
Socialism will bring ruin to every nation that was formerly Protestant. Patriarchs and Prophets says on page 535, there are many who urge the great, with great enthusiasm that all men should have an equal share in the temporal blessings of God. But that was not the purpose of the Creator. A diversity of conditions is one of the means by which God designs to prove and develop character. Yet he intends that those who have worldly possessions shall regard themselves merely as stewards of his good, as entrusted with means to be employed for the benefit of the suffering and the needy. Did you catch that? He wants to help us be good stewards. Councils on Health, page 230, says, Christ has said we shall have the poor with us always. The poor as well as the rich are the purchase of his blood. The cares of this life and the greed for rich eclipse the glory of the eternal world. It would be the greatest misfortune that has ever befallen mankind if we are all to be placed on equal footing with worldly possessions. That tells you a whole lot. This tells us that rioting, ruining, and protesting are not in God's plan. Patriarchs and Prophets 242. The king and his counselors had hoped to subdue the Israelites with hard labor and thus decrease their numbers and crush out their independent spirit. That's how we'll be treated for disobedience to the human laws. It goes on to say, failing to accomplish the purpose, they proceed to a more cruel measures. Orders were issued for the women whose employment gave them opportunity for executing the command to destroy the Hebrew male children at their birth. Going on, it says, Satan was the mover in this matter. He knew that a deliverer was soon to be raised among the Israelites, and by leading the king to destroy their children, he hoped to defeat the divine purpose. But the women feared God and dared not execute the cruel mandate. And the Lord approved their course and prospered them. Going on, it says, the king, angry at the failure of this, his design, made the command more urgent and extensive. The whole nation was called upon to hunt out and slaughter his helpless victims. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter shall, you shall save alive. And so it shall be at the end. Worldly people will be authorized to slay God's loyal Sabbath keepers. What a terrible time, but what a glorious time. God will provide the latter rain for his children and give them their bread and water. Great Controversy 629 says, the people of God will not be free from suffering. You know, you hear that preached a lot. Oh, we, we won't have to go through the tribulation, but God says you will. But while persecuted in distress, while they endure privation and suffer from want of food, they will not be left to perish. That God who cared for Elijah will not pass by one of his self-sacrificing children. He who numbers the hairs of the head will care for them and in time of famine, they shall be satisfied. While the wicked are dying from hunger and pestilence, angels will shield the righteous and supply their wants. I'm reminded of a story, you know, of a man that was in jail, and the warden wasn't giving him any food, just water. I don't remember if it was a cat or a mouse that took the bread off his table and brought it to him in the jail cell. God will provide however he does it. Okay? 
To him that walketh righteously is the promise. Bread shall be given him, his water shall be sure. When the poor and the needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. Amen? From Great Controversy, 630-631. Could men see with vision, they would behold companies of angels that excel in strength, stationed about those who have kept the word of Christ patience. With the sympathizing and tenderness, angels have witnessed their distress, have heard their prayers, and they are awaiting the word of the Lord commander to snatch them from their peril. But they may, must wait a little, yet a little longer. The people of God must drink the cup and be baptized with baptism. The very delay so pain, so painful to them, the best answer to their petitions, as they endeavor to wait trustingly for the Lord to work, they are led to exercise faith, hope, and patience, which have been too little exercise during their religious experience. Yet for the elect's sake, the time of trouble will be shortened. Notice what it says, the time of trouble will be shortened shall not for God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. I want you to think of one thing this morning. God delivered the Israelites and took care of them for 40 years with no provision for food or water. 40 years. Can he take care of you? It will be no different in the end. There'll be signs and wonders, just like there was plagues for them, there'll be plagues on the world too. But God will deliver. Amen? Amen. There'll be devastating plagues. Do you think that God's word, the same power that provided for them back then can provide for you today? Do you think God has the same power to break sin then as he does today? I stand here before you, you know, as an alcoholic and telling you he has the power. Smoking 68 cigarettes a day, I shouldn't even be alive. He does. And he can, he can give us the power to break sin in our lives and over every besetting sin or defect. And he has the power to sustain us on our travels from here to the heavenly kingdom. Amen? But we have a work to do, and that is to tell others of a saving God. We have to bring our hearts in harmony or unity with his. There's one thing stopping us, and that's our sin. And that's what's holding back the latter rain. And he asked us to give us our hearts to him wholeheartedly. And we need to be joined with him because we cannot make it on our own. Amen? Even our thoughts and motives. I can't dwell on the darkness, but light will dispel the darkness. Amen? So my question to you this morning is, what will you do? to be ready for his soon appearing, because I believe it's very soon. Amen? We need to draw closer to him and tell others, as many as we can, pray for others like never before, because your life and their life depend on our prayers. Amen? How many want to be ready when he comes? Let's stand. And close with number 506. God's truth abideth still. 
His kingdom is forever. Shall we pray? Loving Father, we ask that your spirit would be with us and help us to reach out to others and tell them of a saving and loving God that wants them in the kingdom as well. And Father, just as you've touched each one of us, may you touch others that we know and love, that they may be in the kingdom also. Bless us this day, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.